whether you live in a moist climate or a dry climate, maritime near the coast or continental mountainous climate, droughts and floods are part of what is going to occur in your, your area, and you need to be prepared for both. Now, when we think about floods like rainfall trigger floods, there's a whole spectrum in space and time. We can have the really large scale floods like what we see on the Mississippi, and those can take months from when the flood starts until it actually peaks. And on the other end of the spectrum, on the really short duration local scale, we could get floods that are triggered by intense rainfall, thunderstorms in particular, where you're getting a life-threatening flood sometimes within a half an hour of when the rain begins, and that's the end of the spectrum we call the flash flood. But there are other ways we could get floods too. There could be structural failures, dams and levees that break, which may or may not be associated with rain going on at the time. There could be floods associated with ice jams and rivers. There could be floods from the sea, either triggered by big storms like hurricanes, we call that storm surge, or by tsunamis, which is independent of the weather, those are triggered by undersea earthquakes and landslides. So floods are not directly correlated with the rainfall. There are certainly many of them are triggered by rainfall or snow melt. But what's happening on the ground is really important. And that's where the built environment or urban environment comes into play. In a natural surface that has trees and shrubs and, and bare soil, a portion of that rain is likely to go into the ground. And only a portion is going to run across the surface to the nearest river. Now, when we've changed the environment, compacted the soils, put in parking lots, urbanized, less of that rain is actually going to go into the ground, and more of it is going to go across the surface to the nearest low spot or river. So urban environments, the built environment, will increase the risk of flooding. There's one more thing, though. When you have really hot fires, they could actually change the structure of the soil and make it more resistant to rain for a while. In addition to that, sometimes because of the fire removing all the vegetation, that runoff takes a lot of debris with it, sediment, sand, and you get mudslides and things like that into the streams as well. One of the most important things a town can do, and many progressive towns are doing this actively, is to move buildings out of their floodways and floodplains, or not build there in the first place, and have those as designated greenways. These can be parks, they could be bicycle and pedestrian paths. And along these floodways, many of them also build what we call retention or detention areas. These are designed to retain or detain excess water during a flood so that it's not moving downstream and causing damage, but rather being held up in a location where it will be released more slowly or absorb into the ground. The very basic thing they could do is educate their population as to what the risks are of floods and where they're most likely. Now, I want to point out that floods, especially in urban environments, will often occur outside the designated floodways. But knowing where the floodways are at least lets you know where the highest risk is. In terms of fatalities, when we think about floods compared to hurricanes and tornadoes, the 30-year average through 2012 Floods actually result in, on average, in more fatalities in the United States than either tornadoes or hurricanes. More than half of the flood fatalities were from people in vehicles. The 10-year average, though, just since 2002, um, actually floods are a little bit less now than either tornadoes or hurricanes. Now, that might just be this 10-year quirk because we had Hurricane Katrina in that 10 years, and we had some major tornado outbreaks, or it could be a trend. But either way, all three of them are, are resulting in close to 100 deaths a year. I'd like to emphasize, though, when we think about hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, um, they're not exclusive. Hurricanes, after their hurricane winds die down and they move inland, can still produce tremendous rainfall and trigger floods. Hurricane Floyd did that. And the same thing goes for tornadoes. In fact, just um, in May of 2013, the Oklahoma City area had a massive tornado. 22 people died that day. Almost two-thirds of those fatalities were people that died in flash flooding from that tornadic storm. And in many cases, there were people that sought shelter in culverts and ditches to get away from the tornado. Floods sweep up a lot of other stuff. It could be natural stuff like boulders and trees. It could be cars, sheet metal, glass. And that all gets in the water, too. In fact, many injuries and fatalities and flash floods are from traumatic injuries, not from drowning. In addition to that, then there's also the hazardous inflammable material. 
So the best way to keep yourself safe from injury or death in a flash flood or a flood is not to get in it in the first place. Don't drive through it, even if you have a big vehicle. Don't walk into it. Don't go exploring flood waters. That's just a bad idea all around. If the flood is rising around you, try to seek higher ground. That's, and also just be aware of where the flood um, potential areas are in your community or where you're traveling. Floods in the United States and around the world still remain one of the, the most serious weather hazards that we face. Floods and droughts. So too much, too little is, is a big problem for humanity. It results in a lot of damages and it results in a lot of fatalities.